Leads, leads, leads. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 loiners over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. My mission here is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, did during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple and expanding crises during their day-to-day working hours. Can we turn things around? We'll find out. To tell this story, I need loiners, loiners like you, dear listener. I need people in Leeds or people from Leeds to come on this show and just tell me what they do and let me record how this decade affects us. Please do donate any amount you can to the Working Hours Project through PayPal or consider sustaining Working Hours with a regular £1 a month or more subscription on Patreon.com. Addresses for support are in the outro. This is intended as an expansive and expensive long-term project which I want to make available to anyone and I can only do that with your help. So if you can, please help. What did you want to be when you grew up? So I guess that ever since I was a child, I was, I've always been fascinated with knowledge. So uh, I was really good at school. And when I was growing up, I wanted to be a writer. Mm. So I guess that my dream as a child was to become a writer. And then my dream as an adult was to be an academic. Mm. So I guess those two things are somewhat connected. Mm. Uh, I still want to explore more the writing side. Definitely. I'd like to, one of my projects that I, I never get the chance to actually uh, do is to write a novel. It is mm. something that, um, about a spiritual journey. So that's something that I, I have in my <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Among the things that I really want to do, but uh, yeah, my dream as a as a child was to be a writer, and my dream as an adult was to be an academic. Mm. Are you too busy to write the novel then at the moment? Is that <laughs> yes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that when you are an academic and also you are a person on social media, and there's always so much going on, and in a way, I'm I feel blessed that I can do this as my job because it is my passion mm. at the same time when something uh, is your passion you just never stop working and so that is the, the downside of doing something that you're really passionate about for for a job mm. but i wouldn't i wouldn't change it definitely but yeah at one point i will definitely have to find time to write my novel <laughs> <laughs> yeah um before we move on to the next bit what what do you think it was that kind of made you go into academia? Was it a particular lecturer or something, or was it a particular book or a particular field of study that opened up to you, and you were kind of like, no, I need to do this now? Like, why why did you stay in in academia? I guess. Yeah, uh, you could rephrase it as, um, why was I mad enough to <laughs> want to become an <laughs> academic? <laughs> not the easiest job uh well obviously there <laughs> there are many difficult jobs but i think for me the uh, why did i want to become an academic i think the still thing the two things that i've always been passionate about were knowledge and esotericism uh witchcraft esoteric practices mm-hmm. and i always felt that witchcraft was understudied and magic was understudied from an academic and a scientific point of view. Mm-hmm. And I thought that it would really enrich everybody's knowledge to to have that, to to have more research, you know, proper academic research mm. done on the on the subject. Mm. I didn't think it was possible when I was in Italy, because in Italy studies on paganism and the contemporary world are still uh, at their inception now, and when I, I I I was about to start my PhD, there was really no opportunity at all. Mm. So that's why I moved to Leeds because mm. I got the opportunity to to study 
and do research on the contemporary world on witchcraft and shamanism uh, in Italy. My field work was in Italy. Mm. Uh, but I, I guess that I am fascinated by knowledge and uh, limits of knowledge and also trying to shed light on things that are often in the dark mm. and try and understand things that are occult in a literal sense and in a metaphorical and in a metaphorical sense i also mm. find that witchcraft historicism paganism are so fascinating on so many levels philosophical mm. levels um in terms of the world view and the belief system the relationship with the with environmentalism mm. and how there's a different conception of the person and the person in the world and the agency of human beings and so there are so many aspects of those religious phenomena that are so incredibly fascinating. And I think that studying them and putting out research on them could really be um, something that enriches everybody. Mm, yeah, yeah. And to have academic research as well, rather than, you know, just someone who works in that field, but is just producing books based on knowledge which may not be that robust and may not be that well researched or sourced or and so on and so on. So that's that's different. You have obviously in, in academia we tend to distinguish between primary sources and mm. secondary sources. Mm. Primary sources are done by the practitioners in this case. And secondary sources are academic analysis on what people produce and what people do. Mm. So I think that both are valuable. It's just that they have a very different, <laughs> a very different aim. Mm. So uh, a book written by a practitioner is about their experience, their perception, and also um, it, it is about it is aimed at resonating on a spiritual religious level mm. and providing meaning and perhaps inspiration for the practice of the person who reads. Whereas academic research is more about accurate information mm -hmm. and providing accurate information, whether it be from a historical point of view or from an anthropological point of view or from a sociological point of view. Mm -hmm. It is more about, uh, I don't like the term of objectives because that has been challenged ever since Immanuel Kant. I would argue even in natural science, let alone in humanities and social science. But uh, yeah, I think that it's more about providing accurate knowledge that is not linked to one belief system only, but it is transversal, intersubjective. You are listening to Series 4, Episode 7, and to my guest, Dr. Angela Puka. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 8th of February, 2023. Hello, I still have COVID. Dr. Angela Puka joined Leeds Trinity University in 2016 and has lectured there and at other universities on philosophy and religious studies. Angela's degrees are in philosophy, focusing on Asian philosophies. During her academic formation, she studied Latin, ancient Greek, Sanskrit and Tibetan, classical and modern, to translate primary sources of interest from different philosophical and religious traditions. During her master's degree, she expanded her knowledge in the field of religious studies, especially Buddhism and the Indian and Tibetan religions at the University of Naples, Italy. Afterwards, her research moved towards paganism, shamanism, and their contemporary manifestations across the Italian peninsula. The University of Leeds awarded her a PhD in Anthropology of Religion in 2020 as a result of her research on indigenous and transcultural shamanism in Italy. Author of several peer-reviewed publications, a forthcoming monograph on Italian shamanism and folk witchcraft to be published with Brill, and co-editor of the forthcoming Pagan Religions in Five Minutes for Equinox, she hopes to bridge the gap between academia and the communities of magic practitioners by delivering related scholarly content on her YouTube channel, TikTok and other social media for her project called Angela's Symposium. If you'd like to see Angela's work, go to youtube.com forward slash Dr. Angela Puka. Follow, listen, share, guest, donate to podcasts you like. And if you don't like this one, what are you doing here? Turn it off. Loiners, get your ass on this show and then get your friends and neighbours on it too. Please join me on Patreon or Ko-fi to provide 
a lifeline for this bloody thing. Demonstrate your support for this show on social with likes, follows and shares. If you want to keep listening to interviews such as these, then you'll have to do something about it. I can't make the show more popular. You know that. Share and recommend Working Hours wherever and whenever you can. Right, let's do this episode 87 of Working Hours with Dr. Angela Puka. Okay, so let's get into what it is you actually do now. So you've touched upon it. We've kind of suggested, uh, given suggestions towards what you're doing. So we know you're an academic. We know you're doing stuff on YouTube. So what is it that you're doing now? And uh, yeah, maybe tell us a little bit about how you got into it. So what I do now is, so I started as an academic. I did my bachelor's and my master's and then got the PG, PGCHE to teach in higher education. And then I got my PhD and uh, I also taught in university, at least three to university. Now I'm focusing more on my project on social media that's called Angela Symposium. And what I do is I try to deliver academic scholarship, academic knowledge on subjects of stoicism, paganism, shamanism, and uh, things that fall under the umbrella of occult topics Mm -hmm. in a fun and entertaining way, I hope. (laughs) <laughs> it is fun and entertaining, but at the same time accurate. So I always provide uh, the references and the references are always peer reviewed. So I, I guess that I'm trying to combine my passion, my creativity, my goth and silly side with uh, providing information that is based on peer reviewed scholarship. And by doing that, it's not just a way of disseminating the type of knowledge that is otherwise precluded to most people because unless you're an academic you might not even know where to search for Mm. peer-reviewed stuff and if you don't have an academic affiliation it might be difficult to access that material Mm. so i think that there is a bit of a the responsibility of us in this so-called ivory tower to also reach out to the public in ways that allow for people to actually know that, first of all, there is research done on that topic and to provide also the content of that research. Mm. So this is what I'm, what I'm trying to do with my project. And obviously I'm hoping that it grows into something, I don't know, bigger, but at the moment I, I hope that it, it really provides value to, to those who follow my project. And my main platform is YouTube, mm. but I'm also on TikTok, Twitter. Um, and everything, every, everywhere else on social media, Instagram, Facebook. Okay. So I'm going to sort of move the questions around a little bit on this one. So I'm going to start off with the social media question, because that's the, kind of the area that you're working in. And, uh, I, I've, I've had, uh, some, you know, YouTubers on before I've had a YouTuber on before, and it's a very popular kind of career path now. Um, but I'll ask my question and then we'll maybe look at some other things. So how does social media affect your work? I mean, obviously it kind of is your work, uh, but what I want to look at is how much time you have to put into it and whether you feel that that time returns the investment, you know, like, is that a profitable use of time? Does the content that you create get the results and the, I suppose, the views and the growth that you want? I would guess that the answer is yes, because you've been doing it for a while. But yeah, what's what's your experience with social media and the amount of time that you have to use it for? So the amount of time that I have to dedicate to my social media is all my time. Mm. <laughs> Most of my time, definitely. It's much more time consuming that people outside of social media content creation may think. Mm-hmm. And whether I'm satisfied about the the output, you know, the what I I guess from it, I'd say yes. Mm. Uh, it is something that I'm still hoping it will grow, uh, but um, I've never experienced maybe on TikTok, but uh, on TikTok I have experienced virality once, mm. but on YouTube, that's my main platform. I've mm. never gone viral. I've never experienced virality. So for me, it's always been like a a slow and steady growth. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the more work you put into it, the more it keeps growing. But mm-hmm. uh, it's kind of not a linear growth, but, you know, it's not as non-exponential either. Yeah. It's like, yeah. A, it's like a slow sort of doubling kind of 
So for example, I know with this this podcast, last year, February, I had 44 downloads. And then last, you know, the month that gone, it was like 150 odd. So it, it's grown, but it's not grown on this kind of steady curve. It's kind of jumped up at odd points. So yeah, I get I get that. Obviously, you're working with video. It's quite a time consuming medium. How do you find that? I mean, what did you did you think about what kind of presentation you wanted to use, or was it just an you know you didn't think about it? You instinctively went for video in the beginning, or yeah, or yeah, now. Yeah. Well, both, I suppose. So, in the beginning, the way uh, it, it all started is that I was, for some reason, I, I kept having this in my on my mind, like that I wanted to um, start a YouTube channel. Um, ever since the first year of my PhD, but then it was during the last year of my PhD that I actually opened my YouTube channel, because. Uh, when I started my PhD, I also started teaching. So I also had a teaching contract. And during my last year, uh, I asked for a sabbatical from teaching. So I thought, you know what, instead of teaching in a class at the university, I can teach on, on YouTube. Mm. And so that's how it started. And the content at first was, I was getting it from the research that I was doing for my PhD because very often you have to research things that don't end up in your uh, PhD thesis, mm -hmm. uh, but you still think that those things are interested, interesting, sorry. And so I decided to make videos on those at first and on aspects of my research. And then as my project kept growing, I also started doing research dedicated to specific topics that I wanted to address. and mm -hmm. that I was not researching um, specifically, but I went I went for the um, video medium because I find it particularly effective. Mm. I also think that a podcast is a great, a great medium, but I guess that I just preferred the video format. Maybe as a as a consumer myself. I tend to gravitate more towards um, YouTube than I do towards podcasts. So I guess you tend to lean more towards the things that you prefer yourself, assuming yeah. that others will as well, which is not always the case because yeah, everybody yeah. has their own their own preferences and their own likings. I would like to also have a podcast at one point. I also had my patrons asking me, you know, why don't you turn some of your longer video into podcast? Mm. I might do that one day, but um, yeah, we will see. I always have so much on my plate <laughs> at any given time that it's yeah. difficult to add things. <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's another job, isn't it? It's yet another thing to do if you turn them into podcasts. So, you know, you, you sound like you've got plenty on at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm also working for an academic association as well yeah. and producing videos for them. Oh, that's nice. So you you kind of you bring in the the your video skills further into academia, and which is good because they've you know I mean it depends on the field, but you know the, the a lot of academics are kind of famous for not being able to use the the tech equipment and stuff. <laughs> How do I turn this on? What what happens here? So uh, yeah, that's good. Um, let's do the COVID question. And I'm kind of running through these because I know that you, you've only got a limited amount of time. So here I want to look at, again, how COVID has kind of impacted your work and made changes over time. But I also want you to kind of look at your experience going into lockdown. And I just want us to look at sort of your workload, whether it increased a lot or whether it dropped off or, you know, or whether it varied, varied wildly. Um, like, was it sort of a huge increase in work was it um just such a long period of time that it's hard to even remember i mean what was your experience with the lockdown and um yeah what are the kind of long-term changes that you've seen coming out of it for me or in general for you for your work so for me when during lockdown in 2020 I was in the final year of my PhD mm. and most of my work was already 
uh, online, basically, and on my computer. Uh, it was different in the years prior to that. So I was lucky in a way that I had completed my field work because mm. for my PhD, I was doing field work in Italy. Mm. And I had done that for the previous three years. So as I said, I was lucky because had it happened like in the first or the second year of my PhD, there would have been, there would have affected the completion of my PhD. Uh, but luckily that didn't happen. So I just wrote up my, my thesis during 2020 and kept working on my social media. Mm. So I don't think that work-wise I was particularly affected. The only thing is that teaching um, moved, teaching moved online. Mm -hmm between late 2020 and 2021, we started teaching on, on teams at my university. Mm -hmm. And so I think in that sense, it was a bit alienating because, and this is a, this was the experience of other colleagues as well, because a lot of students tend to be shy and they don't turn on the camera. Mm. And basically you are talking to a screen, you don't have any any cues from from your students as to whether they are listening, if they're paying attention, if they are getting what you're saying, if you have to explain it better. Mm. Sometimes, you know, even the um, smallest cue can help you as uh, as a lecturer to to improve your delivery and gather whether there's something that you should explain in more details. Where and also from a human point of view to just have little dots with yeah. uh, initials of the students instead of their faces, it, it felt really alienating. Mm. So I, that was the part that I didn't quite like. I don't mind working from home. In fact, I think they like it, mm. generally speaking. But that aspect of lecturing online, I didn't particularly appreciate, to be fair. Uh, there were some students who were nice and turning on their camera, mm. even because of that, because they knew that for us, it made things better. But most students would just not do that. And that, you know, that really makes it difficult and makes you feel like you're talking to a wall or something. Mm, mm. I know you... you sort of, I think naturally your assumption is like, uh, you know, they're just... They're just not listening, but probably the reality is more like they're multitasking. So they'll be doing something else while having the lecture on and, you know, try to try to do two things at once. Um, work life balance wise, obviously, you've said, you know, being interested in something means you don't really get to stop working. Um, how were you at kind of keeping that separation and how were you at sort of you know, the, the, the self-care and so on through, through the lockdown, was that quite easy or was that something that you had to make an effort with? I had to make an effort with that and I'm not sure that I completely succeeded. I think that, uh, even though work-wise it was a good year in terms of, you know, I was teaching, my YouTube channel was growing and I handed in my PhD, I had my uh, be our watch at the examination in November 2020. So I had accomplished a lot, but it, it was very tough here for me from an emotional point of view, from a health point of view. So it was something that wouldn't transpire on the outside because I'm generally very cheerful and I just get on with things. <laughs> but yeah. it, was a, it was a tough year for me, I yeah. think. And... um. I, yeah, I guess that I was just trying to dedicate myself to work and hoping that it would just go away. For me, one of mm. the most difficult things was that I, that I wasn't able to go back to Italy because I'm Italian, as you can tell. Mm. Um, and, you know, I had to stay away from Italy for almost two years and mm. I couldn't see my family. And uh, I remember that it was really, really difficult for me when over Christmas and this was when Brexit was also um, mm. happening and um, I just wanted to send Christmas cards to my family, to my sister, my mom, and they just went to the post office and they told me that they couldn't, they couldn't send them 
because, mm. you know, the borders were closed until they figured out what happened with Brexit. And I just remember going back home crying with these letters <laughs> in my hands. Um, but then I managed to go back, <laughs> luckily, as soon as it was possible, even though it was a hassle the first time that I went back. But then I just gave them the, the letters in person when it was possible. But yeah, it was a very tough year, even though, as I said, I don't think that people realize that or know that <laughs> because yeah. I, I, you know, the, the way I portray myself on social media, like a lot of people do is more, and also I tend to be a cheerful person. It's not mm. like I, it's not like I fake it. I am a cheer. I am a cheerful person, but I also have my down moment. It's just that I don't record them. <laughs> so mm, mm. Those are things that my the people close to me see, but mm. not not the world. And sort of social circles shrunk because, you know, you kind of it, the, the the sort of people that you are in touch with a lot normally you were still in touch with, but that wider circle of people that you would see sort of semi-regularly seem to kind of get forgetting, forgotten, forgotten sometimes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, and and it seems like, I, I don't know if you find the same, but even coming, coming out of lockdown, that a lot of kind of socializing and social groups have kind of are not there as much or have diminished and... It, it kind of seems to slowly be coming back if it if it does come back at all. But it seems to have, I think there's longer term impacts that we don't necessarily consider um, that are still sort of there with us. I think that I, I you know, for me, I tend to be very sociable. Mm. So as soon as it was possible to have social contact and just <laughs> wanted to, to get a lot of it. Uh, so... I personally didn't feel like it made me colder or anything mm. of the sort because I'm not cold as a person. In fact, I had to learn to tone my Italianness down when I moved here because <laughs> I think that I might have seemed odd and inappropriate <laughs> when I first moved here during my first year just because as an Italian, I'm naturally very tactile and hug people and kiss people not because I want to assault them <laughs> but because it is because it's just uh, normal for us yeah. so you just meet somebody and you kiss them and it's fine <laughs> uh, so, so whereas here in in Leeds you know in northern England it's like oh, <laughs> people are shocked if you, if you touch them <laughs> even the arm you know you just see the reaction that's like <laughs> I've not electrocuted you. So obviously I I learned to, to be a bit more like an English person Sweet. when I'm here. And then I go back to my Italian nature when you can go back to Italy. <laughs> okay, well we'll uh we'll move on to the Brexit question. Um so again, this is looking at sort of effects on your on your work since we have brexited have you noticed any change in your work has it affected things at all and have they been good or bad or what's your experience of of brexit so my experience of brexit was that um, when i got the news that i got the, the position and uh you know with my phd and the the teaching position it was literally a few days before brexit happened so i remember that i stayed up all night to look at the at the referendum results and when i saw that uh the leave won i for me it was shock it's like wow i'm about to change my life and i'm about to move to a place that doesn't want me mm. isn't that great uh, and it was it was a shock because I was feeling so elated because doing a PhD was my dream, and then seeing that was a bit of a, um, a cold shower. Mm. So that wasn't um, yeah that, that was a bit sad, and I think that generally speaking, the academic world tends to be very international, mm. and so you perhaps don't experience as much uh, of. And, you know, the um, 
the, re the reverberation of Brexit in universities and the academic world. But I, outside of the academic world, I think that it was palpable. The fact that if you were a new person, probably especially those who were leavers, they would just treat you like, oh, you haven't got the news. We don't want you here. And uh, so I have received, um, uh, you know, I've uh, had xenophobic um, behaviors uh, towards me by people um, and in a few cases also students. But in terms of how that affected my work, I think it affected me more in terms of psychologically and emotionally. Mm -hmm. But since my work is primarily online now, uh, it didn't affect me as much. Uh, it affected me more on a personal level. Like, for instance, having difficulty sending things to my friends and uh, everything seems more difficult in terms of the exchange that you have yeah. with um, mm. with the, with continental Europe. Yeah. So uh, I, I think that it affected me more on a personal, emotional and psychological level. And obviously, when you get people that are xenophobes, it's never fun. But mm. I just classify them as what they are, mm. small-minded people. <laughs> mm. I, I mean, that's all well and good if it, if it, you know, if it's kind of name calling that you can push to one side. But it's, um, you know, in some cases, it's it's literally threatening, you know, and mm. and. I yeah. think that for me, especially, um, probably the worst was in 2016 to 2017. Sort of at the when, height of it. Yeah, I think yeah. it was the the height of it because then it just went down. But yeah. I think that during those two years, people just thought that, you know, they could trust everybody from the EU. Mm -hmm. Not within academia, because I said I'm lucky because academia is a very international place. Yeah. but. Uh, or even other colleagues noticed that they were impacted and mm. even students would comment on, you know, on where you came from and whether you were heading back or mm. stuff like that. Mm. Um, and outside of academia, I think it was a bit harsher in terms of the things that people would say and mm. uh, how they would treat you. But the height of it was... 2016 and 2017 and then it just uh i think probably some of them realized that how great of a decision it was <laughs> mm. Mm. yeah i i was working in a call center in 2017 uh after after the vote and well i started 2016 through into 2017 and it seemed like it had just been an excuse for a bunch of people to ring up and go Oh, we can all be racist now. Isn't that great? And it's like, yeah. well, oh, you're just assuming we all want to do that, are you? Um, yeah, so it, it was just an outward kind of thing. I mean, not that it still isn't, but I think as well, it, it ebbs and flows with the amount that the press are pushing it. I think we we mm -hmm. see, you know, sort of spikes when when there's more coming from the press about it. Um yeah, I, you just re reminded me of one of the comments that I had from uh, actually a colleague. And I would say how academia was more better than the outside world. But I also got some comments that um, were very unpleasant in my own um, work environment. So there was this um, old male colleague who said, um, oh, you're Italian. Are you afraid that you uh, will be locked out of, of Britain? And I replied, I don't know. Are you afraid that you will be locked in? Because, you know, with Europe being so much larger than the mm. UK, I would be much more worried if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wake up calls. <laughs> so, I honestly think that, you know, Brexit affected more negatively Britain than it did the EU. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what have the EU lost? Nothing. Um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, this is a, a topic that tends to get me a bit heated, so I'm sorry if I sound like I am because I probably am. 
<laughs> because, you know, and all the, the things that I, that I was told, like, oh, there are people that come here in the UK because of the uh, free healthcare. Mm. I mean, do you even know what happens in European countries? Because mm. Italy has free healthcare and it mm. works better than the NHS. Mm. So what are you even talking about? <laughs> well, the, the thing is, they don't know. They don't know. Most of the people that are talking about those things, they don't know because they haven't been anywhere, you know, and they've, uh, the only media they've ever been exposed to is British media. Yeah. And Farage. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this and there's this assumption that because a lot of British media and we see a lot of American media, there's this assumption that when they say the world, they mean the actual world. But it's like nobody outside of the English speaking world is looking at this news in this way. Everybody else is looking at it differently. They all have their own different perspectives and they're all seeing a different thing than we're seeing. So mm -hmm. it's like, we may think that we think this and it's replicated across the world, but it's not, you know, but it, that kind of uh, idea is, is sort of seeded in us that, you know, mm -hmm. oh, we all think this. No, we don't. <laughs> mm. I think that I'm, I'm also a bit sad that it created animosity between uh, Britain and the EU countries, because I think that even in Italy and other continental European countries that are part of the EU, there was this perception that Britain just hated us. Mm. And so um, I was under the impression that also in EU countries, there was this perception like, oh, now British people or Britain is kind of our enemy or mm. because I, I don't know if the news was popular here, but since I was still in Italy, obviously I got that news, but the, the day before the Brexit referendum, uh, lots of European countries in the EU, including in Italy, like in Naples, in Rome, they were projecting the um, UK flag mm -hmm. on our main buildings, like our institutional buildings, mm -hmm. as a way of saying, stay with us, you are, you know, you are with us. And I thought it was so lovely that we did that. And it happened throughout uh, Europe and uh, that's when in Italy there was that. So seeing that the day after they just put it out, it's like, I think that a lot of people felt uh, hurt because of that. You know, the sense of we really wanted you to stay with us. You even had a privileged <laughs> position in the EU. So mm -hmm. do you hate us so much that you just want to that you just want to leave the union? So I think that it it wasn't just the political and the economic side, but um it's also important to take into account the psychological and emotional impact that certain decisions have on on people. I think that tends to be underestimated because mm -hmm. we think that uh, the um, political decisions and the laws and the economics just runs the countries. But I think that a lot of those aspects are massively determined and influenced by how people feel as well. Mm -hmm. So there were colleagues of mine who are British who said, oh, now when I go to, to the EU, especially during those first two years that I mentioned earlier, they they said, oh, I would love to have on my forehead, I I, I was a Remainer or something like that, because mm. they also perceived that sense of like that people had that sort of rejection towards them uh, when they were entering other EU countries, which is bad. I just don't like, you know, animosity of any sort. I think that we are better when we col collaborate and when we cooperate. So that's why I, I was also in favor of the, um, of the, of the union. And the EU does have its problems. It's not mm. like it doesn't mm. have its problems. That, I think that was never in question. But I think it's always better to stick together and solve the problems together as opposed to just go each their own way. I mean, it's not the Middle Ages anymore. We, we're all better when we work things out together and maybe I'm going to be weaker on one aspect and you're going to be stronger on and the other aspect and we can help each other. That's how it works in society, I think. When you have a society that is based on cooperation and collaboration as opposed to competition and pinning one against the other, you just help each other out because I'm going to be better at one thing and you're going to be better at another thing if we 
get together, we can help each other. And the final result is, is much better and much and more, much more productive. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Okay. So, um, let's cover climate change. <laughs> <laughs> So the question from, from one angering topic to another. Oh yeah, there's full of happy questions this show. Um <laughs> and talking about work, everyone's favorite subject. Um so yeah, the, uh, again from a work perspective, um Leeds obviously is a city that has declared a climate emergency. Um I'm kind of big on climate stuff. Um so this was always something that I wanted to kind of explore and have conversations with people about climate change um so from a work perspective in your work is there anything that you can do to promote uh awareness or uh mitigation or adaptation to climate change well i think that my study of paganism actually provides a, a worldview and a belief system that is very friendly towards you know that issue and environmentalism so um, i think that's the I, I don't have perhaps a direct effect on climate change with my work but an, an indirect effect i would say yes because uh again i think that we tend to when we try to analyze things in in society we tend to look more at, at the actual actions uh, but we often don't see what is at the source. I think that at the, um, at the source of uh, changes in society is the belief system and the worldview that people have. So if you think that you are uh, a person and that everything around you is something that you can use and abuse as much as you want, because it is just things. Mm -hmm. You use them, you throw them away. And... You know, that is your worldview and your mindset, your belief system, and that feeds into, you know, the worsening the situation with climate change. Whereas if you hold a worldview and a belief system where you are not just, you know, the, the person, the, the ruler of the world and ruler of the natural world, you are actually interacting with something sacred. The trees are sacred. They are imbued with soul as much as you are perhaps even more. <laughs> so um, everything around you is divine. The earth is con may be considered a, a deity, a goddess, and you have a, a completely different perception of what is around you. So it doesn't feel like a duty or a chore from in your actions. It just feels something natural. Yeah. Because you feel like you and the earth are the same thing. Everything is interconnected and you see the sacredness in what is around you, the sacredness in the trees, the sacredness in even in the, uh, you know, the, the technological things. They are all part of nature. Even yeah. if they are man-made, yeah. they are still part of nature. And so having, you know, so much wastage is something that would not really align with that kind of uh, worldview and with that belief system. So that's why so many pagans are uh, very much advocates of environmentalism. And you will find them um, the first line when, uh, when it comes to, to those kind of battles, because they are definitely very important. Okay, I'm going to actually spend a little bit longer on this I've got, I've got to say first of all that's the best answer i've had to that question so far um, no, thank you <laughs> and um yeah so did i see i think i saw a thing that said i thought i saw a potty tat i i think i saw a thing that said that paganism is the fastest growing religion in the uk is that correct um I'm not sure if it is correct. I have, okay. but it is it is potentially correct. Yes, I think that I read it when uh, in the U.S. that is the fast-growing religion mm. in the U.S. All right. It is probably true that it is also the fast-growing religion in the in the U.K. It is definitely a fast-growing religion more generally in the world, mm. uh, especially in the Western world. Uh, even in Italy and in other European countries. Mm. And you can even tell that because every year there are more pagan study scholars and more research on paganism as well. Mm. So 
I think that, well, obviously, one of the aspects of paganism is that it's not evangelical. It doesn't mm. want to convert you because it doesn't have the standpoint that other monotheistic religions have. The idea of a monotheistic religion is one God, one truth. Mm. So I'm right, you're wrong. Mm. Whereas a polytheistic approach, a pagan approach tends to be more inclusivist. You see that even with ancient forms of paganism, when the Romans went to Egypt and encountered Isis, they didn't say, oh, she's a false goddess. She doesn't exist. Mm. They just brought them to Rome and mm. included and included her. Mm. So, and then obviously I had also political reasons, but, but that's besides the point. Mm. In paganism and polytheism, there's more of an inclusivistic approach. So. Uh, it's not really the case that um, I, I want to say, oh, people should be pagan because that would help environmentalism, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that would be very non-pagan of me to say that. Mm. Um, that's clarified. I think that whether somebody is pagan or not, perhaps uh, challenging the way we see us in the world, mm. not as the privileged ones with soul whereas everything else is just an object for consumption. Mm. Perhaps that kind of worldview of interconnectedness, of recognizing the sacred around us. Mm. I think that regardless of one's religious um, label, affiliation and so on, I think it might still be beneficial. Because if you don't change at the source, mm. how people see themselves and their place in the world, mm. I think that it's much more unlikely that things will change in how they behave mm. and how they interact with the outside world. Mm. So the hidden side is less talked about, but I think that it is perhaps more important. Mm. And I think as well with the kind of, you, you can have various perspectives of well, what is the what is the main religion now? You know, some people might say it's neoclassical economics and some other people might say it's consumerism and some people might say it's actually you know, the the religions that we know as a traditional religions. Um, I've done one of those things where I did a big fancy frilly intro and then I've forgotten what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to scratch that and move on to the next question. So we've done all the, we've done social media, we did COVID, yeah, so we've done all the, the changey questions. So this is now uh, the more fantastic questions where you get to, Kind of... Can I ask you a question? Too? Yeah, go on, go on. <laughs> How did you come across my my project? Uh, so I found the Esoterica channel. Uh, well, I found let's let's talk religion first. The Dutch guy, I can't I can't remember anybody's name. Sorry, um, but you might know his. Uh, you Philip. probably know. Yeah, um, and then I came across Esoterica, and then through Esoterica, I found your channel. Um, mm. but I love Esoterica. Um, I mm. think he's, he's really great. <laughs> he's got a really dry sense of humor as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's how I found you. But, um, yeah. What, what was I going to say? I can't remember. It won't, it, it, I've lost it now. Um, but yeah, so these are questions where they're a bit more fantastical. So. I'll start off with universal basic income. I imagine you're familiar with the universe, universal basic income. Yep. So if there was a UBI, how do you think that would change your work? Would you do, would you still be doing what you do now? If there was a UBI, if you're still doing that, would you change it? Would you do less hours, for example, or would you be doing something else entirely? Or would you not be thinking about work and you'd just be out? doing other things no i think i would still be doing my work mm -hmm. um you know if i can contribute in any way by doing something that i'm i'm good at hopefully i i would still do that mm. so i don't think that it would change much in terms of my my work mm. um maybe i would feel less stressed <laughs> i would still be working the way I do now. Um, I mean, would it give you, I mean, I, I don't know how, how well 
because I hear a lot of YouTubers or people with their Patreons who, you know, they're, they're trying to get as many people as possible. I, um, and quite often it can be a struggle and then they can be very reliant on the algorithm to get their income. And then the algorithm might be like totally ignoring them one month for whatever reason that you can't see. And then you get all paranoid and think that YouTube's out to get you. <laughs> um, do you have any difficulty with any of that? I mean, do you like, do you go through cycles of, uh, I don't know, like, is it, is it easy to kind of remain comfortable and secure or are you in kind of, you know, precarious? Ups and downs. Yeah. Yeah. I think that you go through ups and downs with this kind of job. So that's why I said, I think if there was something like that, I would feel less stressed about yeah. that. But I would still be doing my my work. Mm. Uh, but yes, definitely you have ups and downs and good months and bad months. Mm. Uh, so yeah, the kind of lack of security can be stressful at times. But I just try and focus on on the work and improving what I do and just hope that it, it pays out. Mm. Mm. Um, just going back to the the kind of social media question, kind of briefly do you think there's a correlation between how hard you work and how well something does or how well rewarded you are like Not I, my, yeah my instinct would be to say no <laughs> i think not necessarily but um it's, you know it's difficult because it depends on so many factors it's not just how hard you work mm. are you working hard and producing um, high quality content because you could work hard and not produce high quality content. Also, are you producing content that people might want to watch because mm -hmm. you might be working hard, but not producing things that people are interested in watching. Mm -hmm. So there are many elements that come into the, into the equation. So you have to make something that is good quality. Mm -hmm. That is something that people find value. Mm -hmm. uh, in whether it be entertainment, education, or whatever it is that you want to provide, um, it needs to be uh, also accessible. So that's where the algorithm plays a role, because you know the algorithm is the one that recommends your content uh, to new audiences, and so you may get new new followers or subscribers or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but they say, at least at YouTube, that. The reason why um, videos are recommended is because uh, people watch them until mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. So the the better the audience retention, the more YouTube will um, recommend your yeah your videos. But my experience and that of other colleagues is also that you find that there are times when YouTube is not recommending you as much, and you have the same type of content. So that can be a concern. But uh, so you also need to stay up to date with the algorithm and how it works because every so often they change it depending on yeah. social media. You know, now, for instance, on Instagram, uh, reels tend to get more traction than um, photographs. <laughs> and in the past, it, it, you know, it wasn't like that. So there are certain things that one needs to take into account. I would say, that generally speaking, uh, it's not the case that the harder you work, the more results you will get. Mm. Uh, I'd say that you get results that are dependent on a number of factors. Mm. And part of it is how much you align your content creation with what, what people want to see. Mm. And what is that, you know, the, also the format that people enjoy the most. So you have to take into account many things. Yeah. Um, I, and I tend to balance out things as well. Like I know that generally my interviews with academics tend to underperform, mm. whereas my um, typical YouTube style videos tend to perform better. Mm. But I will still do interviews with academics because I think that they are valuable. And so I try to give to my audience what they want, but at the same time, what I think they they need to learn because otherwise you run into the risk of becoming like those TV programs that get worse yeah. and worse just because they are trying to appeal to as many people as possible. So I don't think that the answer is trying to appeal to as many people as possible, but to find your niche and 
to in that case, yes, of course, you have to listen to your audience. But at the same time, you have to be yourself and balance what is that you want to provide, the format that people want to watch, the type of content that people in your niche want to watch, mm. and also what you want to mm. um, put out. So once you find that balance, and of course you do work hard on it, I think mm. that you get results. And also with consistency. Social media require consistency. You cannot just post every number of months. There are YouTube uh, videos, the YouTube channels that are successful doing that, but that's the exception is not the rule. Mm. Okay, so I'm going to go on to my last question. Um, yeah, I'm, as I say to guests quite often, um, there's lots of stuff that people will bring up when they're talking that I'm kind of like, oh, I'd be really interested to explore various things further. Uh, but also I've got to crack on and do the other questions. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I'm not ever cutting anyone off. I'm just trying to keep things moving along. Um, so the final question is, if you could change any three things about your work, and you can be as practical or as fantastical as you want with these, uh, if you could change any three things about your work, what would they be? Three things. Mm -hmm. mm. So what I would change, I would change my work-life balance and they would improve it because I probably tend to work too much. Um, the second thing, maybe I'd like to get better at my content creation. I, I've improved lately my video and audio quality, but I, I, I would probably, I could probably do better with the, how I narrate things. Mm -hmm. I think that I'd like to turn my scripts more into a story-like, um, you know. Um, I don't seem to be able to do that when I get on and I write the script. I tend to be more technical, perhaps. So I'd like to improve in that respect. Do you still um, write them quite academically? Is yeah. it just, just the training? You're just kind of... You can't help I it. think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that I tend to just write them as if they were research papers. Yeah. Um, and I think that I, it, it'd be better if I learned how to turn them into more of a narrative. Yeah. 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 So I, I'd like to improve on that front. And then the third thing that I'd like to improve. <clears throat> I don't know. I guess that I'd like to reach out to, to more people. Mm. Um, but I'm not even sure. I'm not sure what I should do differently to do that. Yeah. So if the thing is, you, you know, because they're always saying niche, you know, niche, niche, niche down, niche down. And you've got a niche and you've got a good niche. But you're also like, well, yeah, but I, I don't just want to speak to this audience. I want to reach a bigger audience and kind of go out from there. So yeah, that is, that is a hard one to figure out. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'll do it. I'm sure you'll do it. <laughs> Thank uh, you. So at this point, oh yeah, before I move on to throwing it over to you, as just a quick question, just for my own interest. Have you seen uh, The Love Witch? Yes. The film? Yeah, good. I thought you might have. Did you like it? Um... In some respects and in others, uh, so I think that aesthetically it was very beautiful mm. and I like uh, ritual scenes because I think they were pretty good representations of early traditional Wicca. Mm -hmm. um, she is a bit out there yeah. <laughs> with her magic, <laughs> but I think that one aspect of that film that I think people tend not to see as much mm -hmm. is her traumatic experience doing those rituals. Mm. I don't know if you noticed that, but her response to especially the sexual rituals, mm. she seems traumatized. Mm. And even the way women are portrayed, you know, even with the narrative of, of all women are better and are liberated now, but the way it is presented, it is still in service of men. Like, mm. you know, women now are liberated. So let's have uh, a sex ritual where I have sex with you. And <laughs> so 
you know, it feels like um, it portrays um, women's liberation in a way that is convenient to men. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and obviously, I'm all in favor. Uh, I'm all in favor of sex positivity and the fact that women can do whatever they want. Mm. The thing is that when doing whatever they want happens to be only <laughs> pleasing men in a specific way, then is it really a liberation? Mm. So I think that if you rewatch that film and look at her and at her reactions, mm-hmm. you see that what she does to you know to those men, uh, which I would. I don't agree with, mm. but it seems like a trauma response to me. So that's the impression that I get. Yeah, because it starts off with her running away from the guy. I'd have to watch it again because it has been a bit of time. But um, yeah, it starts off with her running away from someone. Now, okay, he's died or she's killed him, but you know, she's she's running away from something that's frightening and upsetting. So yeah, I I I'd say that reads yeah. Mm. Right. Um, okay, so this is the point where I throw it over to you. So if there's anything that you want to promote, um, anything coming up or anything that we haven't talked about that you'd like to touch on or say, now's your chance. So, yeah, over to you. Uh, so, yeah, everybody, yeah, thank you for having me on. And I thank everyone who has uh, listened to this podcast. And if you're interested in the academic study of magic, witchcraft, paganism, the occult, uh, just look up Angela Symposium or Dr. Angela Puka, and you will find me on all social media platforms. And my main social media platform is YouTube, but you also find me on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and um what else? And Twitter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, on most social media platforms, you will find me as either Angela Symposium or Dr. Angela Polka. Brilliant. So thank you very much for doing this. Um, and I will stop the recording at 13.13. Thank you again to Angela for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. You can follow the show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leeds. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released. DM me with your questions, or most importantly, to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Not destroying your brain with social media? Then send me an email to workinghourspod at western-studios.com. Or if you'd like to be anonymous, email me at westernstudios at protonmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember to share it with your networks. Please, please do chuck in anything you can to help Working Hours grow. Go to Kofi, that's ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for £3 a month. And or you can make any one-off donation of whatever amount through that site. Or you can go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support Working Hours from as little as a pound a month. There's also an Outlander tier for non loiners at £5 a month and a £12 a month big time tier for anyone who feels flash. I'm not really offering anything much on the Patreon yet, as I'm already doing more than enough unpaid labour on this project. If and when things pick up, then we'll see. The goal is to make the podcast and my commitment to it both possible and sustainable. If you are happy to make a regular contribution, but you're priced out by a pound a month, you can go to librapay.com, that's L-I-B-E-R-A-P-A-Y dot com forward slash Western Studios forward slash donate and donate from as low as a penny a week all the way up to £89 a week. And people say I'm pessimistic. Again, you can also make one-off donations through LibraPay, which you can do either publicly or anonymously. Remember to like, share, follow and subscribe to Working Hours. Work for peace and plan with kindness. Okay, that's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, Leeds. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. 
Follow Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Western underscore studios underscore Leeds. And on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash Western hyphen studios or go to western hyphen studios dot com.